The FCC, um, where it does tend to act is in terms of regulating television content. And it has, as a result of the George Carlin incident, which I urge you, I put this on the syllabus, I hope you listen to it. If you didn't, you know, you can Google this particular story about the George Carlin incident, which provides a nice overview. Uh, just Google CNN and George Carlin, seven, seven words you can't say, and you'll find it. Okay. As a result of this incident um, where Carlin is on radio, Pacific Radio, and identifies the seven dirty words that you can't say on uh, the airwaves, or the FCC will fine you. Right? And by identifying those words, he effectively codified the policy, or forced the FCC to codify its own policy. Right? So it has subsequently done so, and you can go to um, the FCC.gov, and it has a guide on obscenity, indecency, and profanity. And this is what it says. It is a violation of federal law to air obscene programming at any time, obscene programming being something like pornography, right? or indecent programming or profane language from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m., which is you know, the prime broadcasting time. Uh, how does the FCC define obscenity? It defines it using the Supreme Court. Uh, three-pronged test, if you will. Uh, will an average person applying contemporary community standards find the material as a whole appeals to prurient interest and only to prurient interest? Uh, does the material depict or described in a patently offensive way sexual conduct specifically defined by applicable law? Does the material taken as a whole lack serious literary, artistic, political, or scientific value? And if it meets all three of those standards, then it is determined to be obscene and it cannot be shown. Right? So basically we're talking about pornography here. Um, this is not an aspect of content regulation that many people have a problem with. Most people don't want to see pornography on the airwaves in an unrestricted fashion. Right? Now the other two, indecency and profanity, are a little bit different. The FCC defines indecency as language or material that in context depicts or describes in terms patently offensive as measured by contemporary community standards sexual or excretory organs or activities okay. and you cannot show indecent material in that 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. time period. The FCC defines profanity as language so grossly offensive to members of the public who actually hear it as to amount to a nuisance. And again, you are not allowed to show that. Now, obviously, this is some vague language, because what are community standards? Um, how do we determine them? Different communities are going to have different standards, so what happens under a system of national networks? Um, you know, whose standards apply? Right? So there are all kinds, there's all kinds of wiggle room here, and this is where we see most of the contention happening. Does the FCC have the right to, or capacity to censor U.S. television or to preempt the um, broadcasting of certain of profanity or indecency. No, it does not. It cannot vet scripts. It cannot uh, suggest to networks that they not show things. However, its power to fine retroactively these same networks and stations for showing this stuff is, it, you know, itself chilling. Okay? So, effectively what happens is that networks learn to self-censor. Um, we've already seen how standards and practices divisions work. Right, they vet scripts and they will circle things that they think might be offensive uh, or indecent or profane and ask that it be removed from the script. The program producers have to negotiate if they want something left in. Right, So we saw in Anatomy of a Homicide they were negotiating how many bitches they could keep in and how many dams they could say and things like that. Um, that's, you know, that's a negotiation that happens within the network. Bleeping is another way in which they self-censor. Um, this is mostly for live programming, so if you've got a live sporting event where someone might get on the mic and talk if you're going to interview players, for example, or uh, the Oscars, the Grammys, right, one of these sorts of things, or the most famous incident, the Super Bowl halftime show featuring Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake, uh, which I'll talk about more in a second. So the idea with bleeping is that you, you have a little bit of a time delay. Uh, between the live feed and when it actually gets shown um, on the television. It's just a few seconds. And there's a person whose job it is to sit by a little button and to press it if they hear anything offensive or profane. Okay, so if, you know, if somebody accepting a Grammy says, fuck yeah, the bleeper has to bleep that out in time that it doesn't air. Uh, 
the other, the final way in which they sell sensors, of course, through rating systems. Um, these are a bit haphazard. Different networks have come up with different systems. Some of them are very explicit, so they'll actually list what's about to come. They'll say things like, this program contains violent uh, content and profane language, sexual, uh, explicit uh, sexual situations, and things like that. Others will just say things like this, right, TV 14. If this is modeled on the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America's rating system, which is age-based. Right, so TV-14 is like PG-13. Right, so you need to be somewhat mature, but not totally mature in order to see this content. Now, the application of these kinds of ratings is also problematic, because there is a double standard, particularly when it comes to sexuality. Uh, so, in some genres, more sexual, sexual content is permissible than in others. So, exa for example, it is more permissible to show sexual content in a drama than in a sitcom. There's also a difference in terms of whose sexuality is at stake. Right? So this is, as you notice, right, a, a rating attached to the Ellen show. Ellen uh, did not have these ratings during the first few seasons, but after she decided that her character was going to come out of the closet as a lesbian, these ratings started showing up on the program along with a message at the beginning talking about sexually explicit content, even when there was no such content, right? So even when sexuality wasn't even a topic of consideration on the show, this rating would appear, right? Arguably driving viewers away from the show, right? So there are some problems with the ways these ratings are applied, um, and the primary way in which content is regulated is still the standards and practices uh, model. The Janet Jackson Super Bowl incident in 2004 created a really chilling effect in terms of uh, content production. It, it really unsettled expectations regarding what the FCC was willing or able to do about indecency and profanity because the FCC took real offense and went after CBS hard on this. Okay, so um, you can see that you know, in 2002, for example, there are almost no complaints to the FCC about television programs. In 2003, there are maybe a few more complaints, right? That's this green line, particularly at the end of the year. I don't know what's going on at the end of the year. I imagine this is maybe the NYPD Blue episode in November. <laughs> that caused all the furor, right? November being a sweeps week. Um, in 2004, we see this spike. This is Nipplegate, right? This is the Janet Jackson Super Bowl incident. Um, you can see the complaints shooting up because, of course, that's a live performance and people are watching it with their children and all of a sudden Janet Jackson's costume gets ripped off. And uh, it's just for a millisecond before she covers it up, but it's still visible and it's still the most TiVoed moment in television history, by the way. So after that, there's a certain vigilance that develops, not only among ordinary viewers, but particularly among conservative activist groups like the Parents Television Council. Um, and they decide that they're going to press the FCC to enforce more stringently the obscenity and profanity, or I'm sorry, the um, indecency and profanity regulations. Uh, the FCC, in response to the Janet Jackson incident, levied the highest fine in its history. It's $1.5 you know, million, dollars, I believe it was. And it fined the local television stations, the affiliates, as well as the parent network. Right? Now this, from the affiliates' perspective, is patently unfair because they had no control over that halftime show. They are simply receiving signals from the network. Uh, why should they be held accountable for it? But the FCC did hold them to account. Uh, and this, this was absolutely chilling in terms of its effect on um, network television production. Right? So in the aftermath of this fine, uh, ER self-censored a scene in which an old woman's breast, part of an old woman's breast, is shown when she's being treated by the doctors. Um, right now, this is not sexual scene. This is a you know a body in crisis being worked on, and yet uh, they felt like they could not show that breast for fear of being fined. Uh, PBS uh, tried to get FCC approval for various of its Iraq War documentaries because they were afraid that the soldiers use of profanity might result in a fine. Um, they, they were able to work that out, but they, you know, it could potentially have shut down their frontline series for quite a while. Right? Uh, in 2004, ABC affiliates, 60% of them, refused to do the annual Veterans Day screening of Saving Private Ryan because they cuss in the movie. Right? 
uh, and they were afraid that the FCC would find them for that, right? So, you know, this, this went to really ridiculous lengths. Um, CBS pushed back against the fine. It was eventually overturned. Um, but, you know, until that happened, this was really, really a damaging incident. Um, and the, the crackdown, the FCC crackdown, had a really chilling effect on network production.